we're live. Hello and welcome Hello. to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I am Brandon Tessers. This is Caitlin. Caitlin Miller. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I wanted to say Caitlin Morgan. Captain mm -hmm. Morgan. I am going to change my name sometime in the next couple of years. Oh, to Morgan? No, not well to Morgan, done. but one of my best friend's name is Morgan. That's not prophetic. I um, used to call her Principe San Morgana, which was funny. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's not Caitlin and, I, <laughs> Caitlin and I work uh, at a private group therapy practice called Effective Artistry. We're both licensed therapists, but this is not therapy for very, very many reasons. Uh, Marie Moran is usually with us hosting. She is off this week. Next week, Caitlin will be off, but Marie will be here with me. And then the three of us will be back together the week after that. Mm -hmm. uh, what this is, it's not therapy, it's just a conversation. And it'll start with just kind of Caitlin and I talking about whatever it is that we're going to be talking about. Usually when Marie's here, we have a little more structure and pick topics, but Caitlin and I mostly just figure this stuff out in the moment because yeah. that's fun and we're busy. <laughs> not that Marie's not busy. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, we, we specialize in using a neurodiversity affirming approach. Um, we do individual couples and family therapy with people in the state of Illinois, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully to be expanded to other states relatively soon. Yeah, that would be lovely. By which I mean in the next like year or two, not like in the next few weeks. <laughs> By tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we also have some executive functioning coaches. Marie is one of them. Um, we work with people from all over the world in a coaching capacity. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've done. I've not done the intro in a while. Um, um, oh, if you're here, please feel free to participate in chat. We like to have comments from people. Mm -hmm. We'll go wherever you go in the chat. So regardless of whatever Caitlin and I are talking about, which you're welcome to join in on that. But also, if you have questions or thoughts or want to take us in a different direction, that's the point of a conversation. Mm -hmm. All the people participating in the conversation are paying attention to one another and are impacted by the things that one another are saying. and. Mm -hmm. What happens, happens. We love comments. They're fun. Comments are fun. It makes it a little harder. We have to be a little bit more in the moment. Yeah. So. Uh, I'll throw this out again just because for the last few weeks, a, a few weeks past, well, like almost two months ago now, somebody mm -hmm. had asked about talking about um, supporting children with speech delays. Uh, mm -hmm. If that person is here, please let us know in the comments and we'll talk about that today. But otherwise, I'll just keep kind of throwing it, I'll try to keep remembering and throw it out there until that person is here and we can talk about it in more depth. Yeah. Otherwise, unless there's something from the chat, we'll just start talking about stuff. Mm hmm. How are you? I am good. I saw the Barbie movie this weekend and I am not prepared to comment on it in a video that will stay on the internet forever. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. I have not. How seen are it. you doing, Brandon? I'm good. I have not seen it. I've I've heard very good things, but mm -hmm. I have not been to the movie theater. I don't know in many many years. Yeah, I thought it was like three years, and then I was like, no, it's probably seven. And then I was like, how interesting time is. Like, I think I usually think of time as the feeling associated with the memory of it rather than actually like, oh, that happened in 2010 and 20, you know, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for me, especially the past, right? Like my mm -hmm. wife jokes with me about the other day could mean anywhere from like two years ago to yesterday. Mm -hmm. And back in the day can mean anything from like 10 to 30 years ago. What about two to 10? We don't talk about that. <laughs> That's that's the forgotten times. That no, sounds honestly, like a Lord of the Rings thing yeah. or something. The dark times. No, the dark uh, times. Let's see. The past two to ten <laughs> years ago. Well, my ten year anniversary is coming up. So. And I can't believe that's called what is it? Copper, nickel, tin. tin? tin. Oh. Which I only know because of the New Girl episode where the two uh, roommates have been living together for ten years and they have a tinfinity party. <laughs> Also, I like the word Tinfinity better than Tin. Yeah. It seems more hopeful. It's our Tinfinity. <laughs> um, tin is I a thought very that already important happened. metal. Is, tin like doesn't get enough shrift these days because we've moved on. <laughs> we have plastic and things like yeah. that. But 
Tim's a big like, deal historically for our species. Tell me more about the history of tin. Well, <laughs> funny enough, right now I am reading a series of fantasy novels in which mm -hmm. the particular magic system is uh, built around utilizing different metals. So tin has a particular special power that it grants people. And, and some that people... That sounds are, alchemical. Oh, wait. There's a comment. I must be in the wrong thing. Oh, my gosh. I'm so Oh, excited. it's from my dad, and it says glitchy. Oh, bummer. Oh, I Fritz. don't know what to do about that. Uh, you can always try looking at your comments coming from Twitch. You can try looking from Facebook or YouTube and see if that does any better. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it, it brings me joy to think that some of the people who are watching this or may watch this at a, because all these are saved. If you're here live and don't know, these are all saved as VOD video on demand so that you can go watch them later on YouTube or mm -hmm. Twitch probably Facebook too, but I don't know. I haven't gone on Facebook in a while. Yeah. I deleted my Facebook recently. <laughs> I realized it was still up and I was like, Ooh, Oh, I think I still have one. I haven't logged in in a long time. Yeah. I logged in and I was like, I don't want to be reminded of all this stuff. So the fantasy novel is alchemical. Tin was important. It is something in the story. No, they what ingest does tin the do? metal and then they burn it and then it allows ingest. them to, yeah. That's part of what is acknowledged is that if they don't burn that metal out of themselves, it can poison them. So they have to kind of like, wow, so it's a very popular series. That's what I was saying. It, it, it hmm. tickles me a bit to think that many people watching this will know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's the Mistborn trilogy by Brandon Sanderson, who is my favorite author. I know that <laughs> people have their complaints about him. He's awesome. I love Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> Great. Writer. I also love myself. Uh, so how do you burn the tin out of yourself? That sounds kind of amazing. So Brandon Sanderson gets mocked sometimes for his magic systems are very, I don't know. Let's talk about sci-fi and fantasy, <laughs> which I know literally nothing about. So this is very helpful. So in sci-fi, there's a, they talk about hard sci-fi versus soft sci-fi. It's like mm -hmm. a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the more that it adheres to actual real world scientific principles, the more it would be considered hard sci-fi. Like so, hard science and soft science? Well. I think people use the phrase hard science. Yes. But to my knowledge, when people are saying soft science, that's just them being dismissive of social sciences. Which are dismissible. <laughs> but <are>. anyways, <laughs> that uh, hold to more scientific principles So hard. Right. So like if you have faster than light travel in your sci-fi series, that would soft. that would move you toward the softer end of yeah. the spectrum. Okay. Uh, and then in fantasy, there's kind of a similar thing where there's hard magic or soft magic systems. And mm -hmm. the more that the magic system has rules, like Lord of the Rings, no rules to magic. <laughs> Gandalf can do whatever he wants, you know? It's all situational and dramatic, yeah. which is very like in keeping with folklore and whatever, where mm -hmm. it's the point of magic is that it's mystical and not understandable as opposed mm -hmm. to just some pseudo scientific kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Brandon Sanderson is very hard magic. His mm -hmm. magic systems, each setting he creates, there are very specific rules about what can be done and how it is done and the limitations of those power, which is part of what I enjoy about those books. It, mm -hmm. it leads to a lot more problem solving, you know, that, that you can kind of go along with the characters and, and kind of come up with and be creative about ways that they can use whatever their finite power set is mm -hmm. in order to accomplish things as opposed to just magic being a deus ex machina kind of deal. Does it feel like any of the things he talks about in his books are possible at some point? In real life? Yeah. No, it's mad. Well, I mean, I'm sure some, some of Some sci-fi does come true. Isn't that what? part of the genre? He does write some sci-fi too, but he mostly writes fantasy. I'm talking about Oh, magic. fantasy. Okay. Different. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think. He does write some sci-fi, but it's more YA stuff, which, by the way, I love YA. I have a lot of neurodivergent clients who are, like, in their 20s or 30s, and they revisit YA, and they love it. And it feels yeah, very YA nostalgic. Yeah, YA is... Let's talk about this stuff. Yeah. I not. seriously know nothing about these things. First of all, so I it's do. Very helpful. I firmly believe that there is. A oh, very, we have two comments. Oh, Coach oh, Fritz again. On magic numbers, real. Uh, 
I firmly believe. Did he say magic number is zero? My magic number is real. I think he's saying oh. that magic is real. Reason that there's. My magic number is real. Sorry. <laughs> there's a reason that there's a uh, a stereotype of intelligent people or neurodivergent people or weird people or whatever mm -hmm. liking sci-fi and fantasy, what mm -hmm. we would call genre fiction as opposed to lit fic, which by and large, I've read a good amount of lit fic and I don't care for most of it. Uh, I think there are reasons for that. I have theories about why that is, but certainly I do think it is a, a real correlation. It does seem mm -hmm. anecdotally, I don't have research data backing this up, but it does seem to me that neurodivergent people are more likely than non-neurodivergent identified people, neurotypical people, whatever, mm -hmm. to like sci-fi and fantasy. Mm -hmm. I, I do think there are reasons for that. Uh, but also YA specifically is kind of like, because mostly when we're talking about YA in this context, we're talking about sci-fi fantasy that's YA, mm -hmm. genre fiction is mm -hmm. YA. And there's reasons for that too. Like YA, especially sci-fi fantasy, tends to be about disrupting and overthrowing the status quo the the protagonist mm -hmm. if you go younger than that like middle school middle readers or primary mm -hmm. readers then it's usually about preserving the status quo those i wonder what happens when people hit puberty well right <laughs> i mean a lot of the like middle and younger when they're doing like adventurous kind of stories it's things like something has gone wrong and we have to put it right especially mm -hmm. a lot of like our parents are missing or our parents have been taken you know a wrinkle in time kind of, you know like, how do we get them back kind of thing yeah whereas ya tends to be more like hunger games or whatever mm -hmm. where it's things as they stand are not good our mm -hmm. protagonist tends to be an outsider or a weirdo in some way mm -hmm. and then plays a major role in shifting the way that things are so that they become better Mm -hmm. very like dystopian sci-fi a lot of it in that yeah in that YA and yeah a lot of like setting off and changing the world and mm -hmm. there's a, a trope of the genre fiction protagonist being kind of an, an orphan right like, even when they're not actually an orphan mm -hmm. to facilitate that kind of story they need some some reason to be taken away from or to leave and go adventuring mm -hmm. as a solo yeah. A lot of this goes back to Joseph Campbell, which I know you're a fan, mm -hmm. right? Are you talking about the hero's journey? Yeah. I'm trying to load Twitch because there are comments and I cannot Sorry. read them. And it is still not working. This is my dad again. It says, try it adult fiction, love YA. It's definitely better. Um, I feel like I'm able to like psychoanalyze your childhood by your dad's comments on the stream. Cool. <laughs> and that was technically a joke. Uh, do you want me to do a handoff with the hero's journey? Is that what you're trying? To <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing until. Yeah. I don't feel like I've settled on some like topic to discuss. We're just kind of talking about things. What are you thinking about? Um, I don't know a thousand things. I don't know what to choose. Something, so many things. Anything. Um, well, I was thinking about, I think you said something about the hero's journey the other day. What was it? You had some, like, I think you had a critique of the hero's journey. Mm. Or I was trying to tell you that, like, oh, Jesus, do you remember? Well, let me, <laughs> for our viewers, talk a bit about what the hero's journey is, and maybe that'll prompt, like, you know. I don't think I'll remember your said. comment, but. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, Joseph Campbell was a, an anthropologist who mm -hmm. studied stories, narratives, and his kind of big theory, I suppose you would call it, is this, the theory of the monomyth, the idea that looking at stories from all different human cultures through all across geography, all throughout different epics in, in history, mm -hmm. that there's kind of one singular core myth that shows up over and over and over and over and over everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it gets different specific details and different characters, but certain beats of the story are the same. Mm -hmm. And the, the most accessible way for most people to talk about this is Star Wars. Because... I think it also holds true for the Barbie movie, which I saw. Well, interesting. Okay. I would be curious to know like who plays the mentor role, but uh, mm -hmm. George Lucas was actually literally a student of Joseph Campbell's. Oh yeah. And so the star Wars, the original star Wars trilogy 
beat for beat follows the heroes. The book that Joseph Campbell wrote was called Hero with a Thousand Faces. The mm -hmm. idea that it's the same story, the same hero, just being in different personas and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it puts out like the arc and certain moments and character tropes and whatever that appear in this story over and over and over. And so George Lucas was literally a student of his in California. And I, from what I understand is, I think Joseph Campbell, Campbell made some comment about George Lucas being one of his best students or something, but I'm not mm. making that up. But Star Wars, beat for beat, follows the hero's journey. Yeah. Sometimes very literally. Like there's one step in the hero's journey called the dark cave, where I the mean, hero has to face their darkest fear alone mm -hmm. and they encounter failure. And in Star Wars episode, well, it's the second movie, but episode five, The Empire mm -hmm. Strikes Back, Luke literally goes into a cave has a vision, a hallucination of fighting Darth Vader, defeats wow. him, knocks his helmet off and sees that under the helmet, it's his own face. So literally goes into a dark cave wow. to encounter and deal with his greatest challenge alone and then have his greatest fear and a failure put in front of him. Anyway, that's, I am certainly not the only person to think that part of the explanation for Star Wars, why it is so central to our culture Mm -hmm. is because it follows the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. beat it's for quite beat, compelling. Taps into some kind of like instinctual storytelling mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think archetypes exist, Brandon? <laughs> I mean, I do, but I, I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> like, what do you mean by that? Um, You're talking about Jung. I would say, I mean, my definition of it, because I have not studied Jung extensively, so I'm not going to pretend to no, but um, would be general. Well, an archetype is an idea, right? Yeah, but I guess I feel like sure. Yeah. Go ahead. What was your next question? Well, there's there's a lot of overlap <laughs> between Jung and Joseph Campbell's yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Carl Jung. We're given like little mini history lessons here because we're talking about this stuff. The mm -hmm. other one. Carl Jung was a student or a disciple of Freud's and again, one of his like greatest, but then also had some disagreements with Freud and the two of them. I actually don't know if they like had a falling out and disliked each other or if they were amiable, even though they disagreed. Oh, like, I think it was a really dramatic falling out. Was it? They yeah. became like adversarial. Yeah. Like Freud was very like toxic masculinity about it. Surprise, surprise. Uh, <laughs> Jung, if you've ever heard of like the collective unconscious, that's Jung's theory that we all, that's why there's such an overlap with the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. uh, Jung's theory that we all, all humans kind of have this collectively shared unconscious as opposed to just purely the individual unconscious. And that's why certain things resonate and show up over and over. And so mm -hmm. that's archetypes. Jung talks a lot about archetypes, these kind of almost symbolic you know, abstract representations of a kind of a person mm -hmm. and that we all have and utilize these archetypes. And I do, I believe that there's a lot of truth in what he's saying. I don't necessarily pull from the collective unconscious thing that we all, it, and again, I, like you said, I don't know enough detail about exactly how he described that to say yeah. too much. Yeah. Um, certainly, I think that obviously we share certain elements of our genetic code with one another humans so there is some similarity in our like genes are our instincts right yeah. like any unlearned instinctual response mm -hmm. comes from genetic programming mm -hmm. and so there is some overlap there yeah my understanding of of jung's idea of the collective unconscious though is that it's more like a continually you know like i am tapped into the collective unconscious we all are tapped into it and it continue it's not just what we were born with in our genes that gets modified it's something we share in an ongoing way mm -hmm. and that i don't so much go into i, I guess i do just describe what do you mean by way. share in an ongoing way um like the like literally there is some almost like the internet oh i get what you mean so like after someone is born outside of any genetic predispositions, they can also evolve if they're evolving within the context of the collective unconscious? The, the, the collective, un like if something happens that changes the collective unconscious, mm -hmm. it impacts all of us in some kind mm -hmm. of way. And again, 
if you were to describe that in different terms, I'm on board with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just doesn't strike me as like some mystical telepathic thing. And I don't know that that's what his argument was. I think he became more mystical when he was older. I think that's when he started studying alchemy. And then I think he got really into Taoism. Um, and then he kind of just became like a wizard. <laughs> well, we're full circle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm so mad I can't read this. It says, comments. seriously, though, I guess that adult. ADD slash neurodivergent influence doesn't change as we age. I'm old and yet I and most of popular cinema is indicative still love YA. Yeah, a lot of, well, I think it's a lot of what we're talking about, that YA taps into something the mm -hmm. same way that Star Wars does or Harry Potter does mm -hmm. or the Lord of the Rings do. Yeah. And it's not to say that anything that taps into that will be successful, mm -hmm. but I think it does mean something that the stuff that with the like, strongest cultural resonance does mm -hmm. tap into that yeah so the barbie movie there's like barbie land and i actually technically don't know the nuances of the hero's journey but there's barbie land that's like this perfect land and then she has to go into the real world and find herself and everything falls apart and she becomes more conscious and more human and then she returns to it and then barbie land is all messed up and then she saves it and then she integrates, and then she decides to be a human, even with all the foibles of humanity. Yeah, that follows the hero's journey a lot. Yeah, I was thinking, too. Uh, Except, like, really pretty outfits. <laughs> it's like... That's not that's not antithetical <laughs> no, to the hero's No, it's not. No. And, uh, um, yeah, so... And the, the thing that I always think of with the hero's journey, that's my favorite part, is imagining, like an orphan in like a magical forest and having the forest have like all these creatures and all these different sort of like it's very archetypal yeah. for a certain part of it for sure yeah so, i think that might be my germanic roots too like <laughs> except like the scary sure. the forests that like kill you instead of like the yeah. cute forest like you're gonna die child sure um <laughs> <laughs> just to hit like some of the beats of the hero's journey just so people can recognize it mm -hmm. so without getting into like the specific details, it's you start off with the status quo. Things mm -hmm. are, things are fine. No, no big problem. Things are fine. Although Maybe usually sometimes a little boring, right? The protagonist is dissatisfied. Yeah. The protagonist yeah. has some sense that they're meant for something greater, mm -hmm. that there's something else more than this that's out there. You know, Belle and in Beauty and the Beast and mm -hmm. Ariel and Little Mermaid. Almost and, every fairy tale or Disney film. Right. Right. So things are okay. In fact, maybe even good. Maybe even good. But the protagonist has a sense that there's something more. They're meant mm -hmm. for something more or the world should be different somehow than it is. And mm -hmm. <laughs> then comes what's called the call to action. I wrote a piece about this a long time ago because I actually do think the call to action matters a lot in hmm. our work um, interesting the call to action is something outside of the protagonist's control occurs which kickstarts the adventure it it puts the protagonist in a position because the point of the status quo being that it's not terrible mm -hmm. just a little dissatisfying is that in order for the protagonist to then go off on some risky dangerous adventure there has to be something that happens that that sparks catalyzes it. that yeah right? yep. and so very frequently that thing will be something which ruins the status quo mm -hmm. so like in star wars it's the droids which show up are the call to action luke didn't choose them they just were there and mm -hmm. then it leads him to meeting obi-wan and then when he gets back to his farm his aunt and uncle have been killed and the farm has been destroyed and he has no choice but to go and do mm -hmm. this dangerous risky thing in yeah. the lord of the rings it's uh gandalf showing up at Frodo's door and putting the mark on the door so that all the dwarves start showing up and think of him as the burglar that they are looking for. In Harry Potter, it's quite literally the letter that comes mm -hmm. over and over and over and over, the call to action. Mm -hmm. Then the hero goes on this whole thing, which there's many, many beats. There's a there's always a mentor of some kind mm -hmm. and the mentor usually dies or is, you know, the, the hero loses access to the mentor at some point along the way. And that's when they have to like kind of step up and whatever. Mm -hmm. They go to the dark cave, they go into the underworld, and then they come back, they fight the big, and and after all that, they do all this dangerous stuff and exploration of fear, mm -hmm. and, and then they complete their task, and they return home, but home is different, and mm -hmm. or they are different, 
mm -hmm. some way that makes it things have changed, but it's a little melancholy, right? Mm -hmm. That. But isn't part of the resolution when they are you talking about the end beat is when they return home? Well, that, so they return home close to the end, you know, crossing back over from the underworld. Yeah, but I thought that part of the resolution is when they return home, they're maybe like a more truer version of themselves or there's something like significant that was like learned and they wouldn't have right, returned they, back they to the status quo. They changed and they grew. And yeah. so when they come back, it's no longer the status quo, even mm -hmm. though they are now home. Yeah. Literally Frodo coming back to the Shire, you know. Uh, <laughs> And sometimes that leads to more stuff because now they've changed in a way that they're no longer a fit for their home or their home has changed in a way that it's no longer a fit for them. Mm -hmm. So was Harry Potter essentially a bunch of mini heroes journey and then like a big heroes journey over the course of all the books? Cause I feel like each book had some version of that. Does that make sense? Well, now we're just getting, I actually, I, I think <laughs> I've mentioned this to you before. I would love, to put together a show where we talk about pop culture through the lens of neurodiversity. And we're kind of just doing a little version of that today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a part of pop culture, so I don't know if I can join this well, show. you saw Brandon. the Barbie movie. So. I know. I don't want to spend time looking at more screens. Oh, no, Karen. <laughs> now we got to talk about that. But I feel like Amy would be a great pop culture person. Wait, what do you mean you don't want to spend time looking at more screens? We don't actually have to talk about this if you don't want to. Um, how is that not clear? <laughs> Why? Why? What is it about looking at more screen? I find that my brain returns to a more natural form of stimulation the less screens I look at. Sort of like what the equivalent. Like if you. Oh, what do you mean by natural? If you look at so many screens and then you're in Maui, in Hawaii, and you're on like the most beautiful jungle hike of your life and you just keep fucking, oh, sorry, checking Instagram. It's like that. Okay. And I feel that way. Do you know way. people who do that? Who go on beautiful hikes in Maui but check <laughs> Instagram the whole time? Why are they going on that hike if they're just going to look at Instagram? It was a metaphor. It was I the know, hero's journey. But this actually... <laughs> We totally switched tack and we can go back to what we no, were No, but okay, about. here's a great example. I got rid of my Apple Watch. I now have a Casio digital watch, and this is not a, Sponsored <laughs> not a <by>. sponsorship. <laughs> okay, and um, keep going. And I already noticed that all the notifications on my watch, which I know I technically could have turned off, and all of the information I got on my watch, I noticed that being away from it is helping to almost like Okay, this is going to sound so boomer of me. Yeah. I think our brains are meant to be calibrated to the direct physical environment around us, which for many, many, many years for human beings did not involve screens. And I think there is something novel and attractive about screens that catches the human eye in a way that predisposes us to continue to stare at them. And then for me, personally... It Keep going. I'm ready. Keep going. I'm listening. <laughs> for me, personally, it takes me out of the moment. What does that um, mean? The moment means a focus on my environment outside of my screen. Okay. I don't disagree with a lot of what you're saying in that, like you said at the beginning, our brains are not evolved for mm -hmm. this particular way of engaging and that dealing with information that we're getting via the screen or whatever as an intermediary, it means that we're we're dedicating resources to things which are not present in our physical environment. Now here's a couple other things though. <laughs> oh, God. Reading does the exact same thing. Not no yes, it doesn't. It does. Can I tell you why it doesn't? Go ahead. Okay. Um the difference for me, and I don't know if I'm just like whatever, I'm I'm myself, but I think Okay, so let's say that there is a book right here and there's a screen right here. And on the screen, it's saying Kim Kardashian's latest husband. And in the book... So dismissive. <laughs> what if the book in your left or the screen in your left hand is a Kindle in which you are reading the exact same text available in the book in the right hand? The Kindle purposefully does not have the same level of contrast, so it isn't as visually stimulating. 
Okay. So then you have a book in your right hand that's like but that's the a coolest. Screen, and you're saying that's. It's a no. So I'm talking the average screen. <laughs> Oh my god. No, this, this is going to be on the internet. This forever. is actually revealing cuz look at the examples you're giving. Is somebody on a nature walk in Maui but looking at Instagram? Somebody reading about Kim Kardashian's latest <laughs> whatever. Screens you are on a screen like all day long when you do I know Zoom and calls. I just like it so much. I really do. Those those clients that you see though wouldn't be able to see you. Yeah, and so the cost is worth the value. But the cost of me looking at screens just to look at screens and doing nothing for my physical or mental well-being versus so you could being be said about reading books. Books for me, because they're less visually stimulating, they usually hmm, theoretically they, they would feel draw less, your attention even less to the environment. They 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 feel less like eating candy. Yeah. So what you're talking about is So now you're telling me actually... I feel too good again? No, no. It's, well, there's that. But I, <laughs> what you're talking about isn't actually a categorical difference between reading a book and getting information. It is. It's about screen. visual stimuli. But your argument is that the screen distracts you more from the reality of your environment than a book would. Um, it distracts me in a way that is more unpleasant but i'm not sure how to characterize it and i had another thing do you, do you think it is telling at all that your example wasn't i'm reading anna karenina on a screen in my left hand or us magazine's latest gossip about kim kardashian in a magazine on my right hand i still think the magazine might be better yeah what does that say to you <laughs> um if a Here's the thing. If a person is referring to it as screens and screen time, as though there's no distinction, that that reveals a lack of nuance in the way which they're... Okay, interacting. then let me be more specific. If a screen involves, for me, social media of nearly any type, and I know this is a great irony that we are literally doing a Twitch stream right now. Do you want to read the comment? Uh, sorry, this was from a while ago. As far as my dad says, as I said, when we first had the discussion about Jung, I think there's a genetic intelligence slash wisdom slash knowledge of familial consciousness is a theory. That my, oh, I, I'm sure that it's not unique to my dad, but something he's talked about for a long time is hmm. this idea of a collective unconscious that is in some way specialized further into the familial, like ancestral unconsciousness. That, um, I would love to be saved by this comment so I can stop answering your screen questions. All right, but someday let's debate about screens because okay. it's not like I'm right and you're wrong. We have different points of view. Oh, okay, yeah. I am right and you're wrong. In this <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's not the vibe, Brandon. Uh, no, it is um, not the vibe. No, I think your concerns, the only reason I, I'm not talking about it because of Do you, you. want to just say cost value and then you can't counter argue me because I'm using your own language? Uh, I don't follow, but sure. <laughs> okay, so the um, I'm I'm the you, cost you're an intermediary of, for the beliefs that a lot of people have, and that I think cause people problems. That's why I'm talking about I it, know. not about you specifically. I know. Okay. Um, so <laughs> the cost of the visual stimuli of a screen, particularly when it pertains what I deem useless information. <laughs> that means the cost of looking at a screen for me is pretty high. I cannot exactly quantify why. And that okay. if the value, <laughs> if the value is higher than the cost, then I'm willing to do it. For example, seeing my amazing clients who I love so much and doing this Twitch stream. But if it's like, I, need, I I think I hit, I don't know if this is a neurodivergent thing. I feel like I hit my screen limit after I work for a day and do like basic like texting of well, friends. Well, it could and be because part of what you might be talking about, if you're talking about cost of visual stimuli, mm -hmm. that's a thing which varies from person to person, right? That's why I kept trying to refer to myself so it would be harder for you to have a counter argument. I'm not counter arguing <laughs> what you're saying. I am trying to get you to engage with it with more specificity and distinction and nuance yeah. because otherwise it's first of all you identified just a moment ago that really you're conflating screens and social media you're not really just no it does about include screens. like 
I don't want to go into like it, it does include like even like a banking app or like a shopping app or the New York Times, like really any app on my phone feels like. So some of this might be a visual stimulation thing. I do think it's visual to you. for me. For me. And not that nobody else shares <laughs> yeah. a similar thing, but it's not helpful for you to think of it as a screen thing, especially like when I point out Kindle and you say, well, that one doesn't do that because of how it is designed. Yeah, it does have a different type of visual stimuli. Right, so it's useful to deal with screens as though they are different things in the same way that it's useful to deal with the written word as though it's different when it's a book or a magazine or a mm -hmm. post-it note. Because mm -hmm. the media is not the issue. The, the content... The media is extremely problematic, but for reasons outside of our current conversation. I'm sorry, I mean media, like the medium, not the media. Oh, the, okay. The, the medium... Yeah. By which the information that's being transferred to you is not the relevant part. Whether you get that information from a book or from words on well, your Well, it is relevant to me because I feel as though I am overstimulated with if that high the, contrast screens. If that is the case, and that certainly is the case for some people, I mean, it suggests a visual sensitivity. Oh, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And there are all kinds of things that you could do in order to lessen the cost, which isn't me encouraging you to engage with it more than you currently want to mm -hmm. engage with it to whatever extent you want. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that you do engage with it, there are things that you could do which would decrease the visual, the cost of the visual stimulation. There are filters and settings and things which could be adjusted to make it so that it doesn't cost you quite as much. Oh, what are examples of that? Well, like red light filters or yellow, uh, um, blue tint glasses, or there's a, a program that I experimented with a tiny bit and I keep forgetting, but I want to look at more bionic reading is a thing that was released a year or two ago that is helpful to a lot of people with ADHD in terms of reading on a screen. But also like the Kindle, it's not backlit, it's side lit. Mm -hmm. So looking at things that don't have the backlighting coming straight out at your mm -hmm. eyes. But yeah, wearing certain eyewear that protects mm -hmm. you. So there, there are a lot of things that you can mess around with to decrease the cost of what you're already doing. Because mm -hmm. like you said, what you're already doing, the value outweighs the cost. Doesn't mean we still don't want to bring the cost down yeah. as much as we can. To free I would up love resources. to bring the cost down. So that's worth looking at. Now, <laughs> separate from that, <laughs> is just focus in on the content, the specific type of interaction as opposed to the medium. It's like, you know, it's like a person who says that yeah. they don't like the medium of visual art, but all they're referring to are magazine ads. Yeah, I feel like the content, this is going to sound very like optimization capitalist of me, but I feel like I There's tried. an inherent incentive for optimization is not yeah, capitalistic. Okay. Let's, let's, let's ignore the capitalism. I think there's a sense of optimization in this, but I like to focus on things that either bring me joy in the moment or Great. help me. Well, this is also joyful, but help me learn things that feels as though I am furthering my path in this world. Those are both great things. Mm -hmm. And your earlier comment which you noted about it feels like candy oh does that mean i'm like not allowing myself mm -hmm. etc yeah joy in the moment is important i don't feel so i guess the point i'm making is i don't uh, you're gonna just talk Look, about content differences i i'm not trying to make the case that you should like or engage with screens more than you do i don't believe that it would be a waste of resources to try and convince somebody of that, even if I did believe it, but I don't believe it. There's nothing you should be doing differently. What I am trying to point out is if, that you're talking about it as though, as many people in our culture do, talking about it as though screen time is um, poisonous in some way, radioactive, as though it is a thing which is, you can engage with it in small doses if you like, but if you do it too much, it really hurts you. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's not that there are not cases in which people are hurt and there's a correlation to the amount of time that they're spending on various screens. It's not an inherent correlation though. 
Like, for example. So content matters? Content matters, but so do a million other variables. Mm -hmm. A study just came out, I don't know, two months, three months ago, mm -hmm. about what apparently they're labeling, oh, what did they call it? Uh, fubbing, P-H-U-B-B-I-N-G, uh, a portmanteau word for phone snubbing. Mm -hmm. Meaning that while I'm in physical it. proximity with you, instead of engaging with you, I'm looking at my phone. That's mm -hmm. me fubbing you, snubbing mm -hmm. you for my phone. Yeah. Uh, the study found a correlation in couples. They were looking at marriages specifically where there's a correlation between the more fubbing is ha the, that is happening and the lower satisfaction there is in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And then the study, the, the study authors in the study talk about this is evidence this, that, that reinforces the theory that if you snub your spouse for your phone, your romantic partner for your phone, it will lead to decreased interrelational satisfaction. Mm -hmm. They not once mention the concept that perhaps people who are in relationships that are less satisfying mm -hmm. to them are more likely to look at their phones rather than continue to engage with mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. it's an incredibly biased take mm -hmm. because it's a very simple logical explanation. I mean, not that their explanation couldn't theoretically be valid as mm -hmm. well, but to not even acknowledge that hmm, maybe when people don't get along, they don't interact with each other as much mm -hmm. and therefore turn to other things instead. Yeah. Because interacting with someone you don't get along with is not pleasant. Mm -hmm. is incredibly biased. And it's biased, I think in part because it allows the study authors to say, well, that makes this very clear. And we have a very simple suggestion. If you want your relationship to be better, spend less time on your screen. Mm -hmm. As though it's simple like that. So how does this relate to my take on my screen time? It's using screens as a scapegoat, as though there is something inherent about the screen, which is problematic, which causes problems. Or I damage. feel like I have tried to say this a couple of times, but some version of, I feel, how do I describe this? Like I can't pick up on the same level of joy in my observations of the natural environment without screens when I am so overstimulated by screens. Sure. And, and obviously it's your experience. I wouldn't be trying to debate your experience, but like yeah. I said, I'm talking, I'm talking to the like cultural concept with the things. Yeah, but I guess I'm trying to say, I don't know exactly how to put my finger on it, but I do feel like there is some um, logistical implication on the way you interpret physical environments. You're like outside of screens in relation to how much time you spend looking at screens and how stimulating you find looking at the I screens I do think are. there's truth to that. And to whatever extent there's truth to that, which I do think there is, mm -hmm. books are even worse. By your own statement, they're not as visually overstimulating. Well, visual data is data in the environment. Mm -hmm. the, the actual visuals of the words mm -hmm. are environmental data. The concepts and thoughts that are evoked in response to the visual data of those words is cognition and therefore not in the environment. So if a screen is more visually stimulating, it is therefore theoretically pulling more of your attention to the physical environment and away from cognition, mm -hmm. which I think actually might be part of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that part of what you don't like about the screens is that you don't get to engage with the concepts that are presented to you in the written word or the visual imagery or whatever it is to the same depth because so much of your resources more so than if it was a written. Thing, and I think it can also include visual. being more disconnected from body cues like hunger and thirst and pain as well as like emotions. Agreed again. And books are the same. I don't think so. There's a reason. I usually, okay, let me give you an environmental thing. I usually read a book at the end of the day. And I do think that it is significantly easier for me to fall asleep after Agreed. reading a book with major implications, but not just these implications on the fact that it is not a high contrast light giving device. 
I absolutely agree. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Yeah. But we got to narrow in and be more specific. Mm -hmm. This isn't about paying attention to body cues. It's specifically about falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to then. Well, but I think when I'm more conscious, like during the day, I don't know exactly how to put it. It's kind of when like ADHD clients talk about being like, what is it called? Wired, but fried or like that. Wired, I Wired, but tired. No, there's a different one. I'm not sure of the phrase. It's like the concept of like, I'm very awake, but I also feel like half dead at the same time. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm not say more about why you're saying that what you're, you're using that term that people, there is some association and I'm literally just thinking about it now in this yeah, moment, this, which is one too. of the reasons why, why I joined fun. this stream. Yeah. Um, for me, there's something about the way in which screens, stimulate my brain, which I'm tempted to call overstimulation, but I'm not quite sure why. That then pulls my ability to, now I'm just repeating myself, be present in the moment. Well, so typically I think when we find ourselves doing stuff like that, especially with that kind of terminology, which is evocative and, and, mm -hmm. and valid and accurate, but mm -hmm. also vague, you know, many different. Which is like my whole use of language <laughs> well that's, that's intelligence just generally intelligence yeah. is about being general and vague yeah but it's quite a like anyway sorry continue. not not vague as in well then no one can call me on anything i don't mean it like that i mean that like if intelligence is some trait or skill that a person mm -hmm. can possess more or less of like to mm -hmm. whatever extent that's a thing and yeah. i think well we've talked about my thoughts and we could talk more about them another time but <laughs> to whatever extent that's a thing the way we measure that is by a person showing up to what is theoretically a novel situation mm -hmm. and then being able to quickly incorporate information from that novel situation into some useful solution attempt. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the mechanism of that is that if I show up to a novel situation, I'm able to quickly identify elements like components of that novel situation which match markers and patterns of other general things, which I have dealt with in the past. Mm -hmm. And then I can utilize solution attempts from those general things in this specific moment. Mm -hmm. So like a specific example, I'm trying to do this to be clear, but I'm already thinking it's gonna make it less clear. <laughs> there's, a, there's a puzzle, right? Where you have uh, three items, largest, middle, and smallest, mm -hmm. stacked on top of each other, and three places to set them. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get those items from one of those places to set them to the other one. And the mm -hmm. rule is that only a smaller item can be set on top of a larger item. Mm -hmm. So you can't just pick up, and you can only move one thing at a time. You can't mm -hmm. pick them all up and move them over, and you can't just set them aside, and etc. Mm -hmm. And so the solution to that is to take the smallest put the smallest where you want them to end up, put the medium in the other free spot, put the smallest on the medium, now move the large mm -hmm. to where you want it to end up, the smallest to the starting spot, medium to the large and small. Mm -hmm. That's a puzzle that I remember interacting with from a video game called Mass Effect. Mm -hmm. I think it might've been in the second one, but maybe in the first one. Mm -hmm. But then it, that same puzzle was also put to me in a different way at a different time mm -hmm. and a, where they were saying, okay, same puzzle, but... Was it your neuropsych testing? No. Oh. This was when I was a tutor, actually, and they were making the point about how difficult logic puzzles can be. So, uh -huh. And they say, okay, in some culture, and I think they, I think, I remember the specific culture they were referring to, but I don't like that they were using a culture for the... In a culture, there is a set of, you know, like, uh, manners, you know, an mm -hmm. idea that certain tasks should be done by certain people, but have to be passed to those people in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And they go through this whole thing, which eventually ends up being that same puzzle. Yeah. But instead of size, it's about seniority and mm -hmm. et cetera. And then their whole point of this was to say, like, see, no one can solve this puzzle and whatever. You know, like, can anyone solve that? And of course, I could solve it because yeah. immediately I recognize it as that puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about. Intelligence is the ability to see a thing and make the specific novel thing mm -hmm. matched against something general mm -hmm. that I already have some ability to interact with and solve. Yeah. This is why 
I think puzzles and riddles and stuff that we were talking about a few weeks ago are so fun because it's mm -hmm. about let me match this against what I already know and find something. Yeah. So when I'm saying that intelligence is about being able to take something specific and make it general, mm -hmm. we could also say that it's about taking something general and making it relevant to the specific application. Mm -hmm. But that's why I think it matters so much to get specific because mm -hmm. otherwise we can just debate and talk and think endlessly. Does this person like me or not like me? Well, that's a very general way of talking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. this thing that they did is could be evidence that they like me. It could be evidence that they so don't. So would an example be like, I have a, like if I had a client say, I'm getting off of all screens for all reasons. Minus way too like general. This, yeah. And then for example, their best friend keeps wanting to FaceTime them and they say, no, I'm off of screens. And then they like lose out on that relationship. Yeah. But also they won't do it. Part of the reason that they screen, won't do what they won't stay off of all screens. It's not possible in our world to not engage with any yeah. screens at all whatsoever. So like can even you to tell dial me... a number on your phone, you have to look at the screen. So, okay. So to go back to my example, can you tell me why I enjoy my apartment significantly more than there is no screen in my immediate vicinity? Thank you, Robbie. It was the first mass effect on Novaria that where that puzzle happens. It was a hacking puzzle. Sorry. Talk about the collective unconscious. Twitch is just a representation of it. Yeah. Uh, sorry. We're all can just I, can we talk of about each other's souls. Why your apartment having no screens in it makes it what? Can you tell me, Brandon, <laughs> why? <laughs> I can't tell you, but we can theorize I, I must admit, I do think I'm funny. It took me like 30 you are years. You very funny. It took me 30 years, but... Um, so, can you tell me why, when I'm sitting in my apartment, and there is no screen in my immediate or peripheral vision, I enjoy it significantly more than when there is a screen in my immediate or peripheral vision? I can't tell you why, because of course this is a specific thing that is specific to you. But I you're can talk an oracle, about, Brandon. I can talk about general <laughs> theories about things that might be relevant to this situation, but that's not at all the same. Is as it going to be about neurodivergence and its intersection with visual sensitivity? No, but okay, that's probably me. impactful. What are some What are some things, Brandon? So there's another concept I. I talk about sometimes, I don't know that I've ever talked about it on the stream or very much mm -hmm. outside of my own head, that I call attention sinks. So if you are conscious, if you are awake, you are thinking. End oh no, story. we only have four minutes. Oh, I need to adjust my clock, it says six minutes. Uh, I mean, this is a new watch, maybe it's five. If you are awake, you are thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, those resources, attention and working memory, or attention and awareness is the word I usually use for it. Yep. Those resources are going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's going to navigating the environment, then it's going to navigating the environment. If mm -hmm. it's going to cognition, it can go in a bunch of different directions. If you're trying to solve some problem, oh, crap, I got to figure out this billing issue or whatever, mm -hmm. then it's going towards holding and manipulating information. The technical definition of working memory is that conscious space in which we can hold information, which we can manipulate. Mm -hmm. Long-term memory holds things in a frozen state. To be able to actually do anything with information, we're putting it into working memory. So if I'm trying to solve a riddle or a puzzle or a video game or whatever, mm -hmm. or watching a show or whatever, the ones which engross me the most are the ones that all of that room, all of that awareness is dedicated to holding different information about either that's being presented directly in front of me or mm -hmm. things that it's evoking and connecting to or whatever. And there's nothing left over to be thinking about other things. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't have enough stuff that I would identify as good problems, things that you want to be thinking about that you find beneficial or enjoyable to be thinking about, Mm -hmm. then you have some spare resources and then your brain just starts throwing things together. It's like, Oh good. We can think about some stuff. Let's think about this. And sometimes that's wonderful and awesome. And you're daydreaming and fantasizing or coming up with a great story idea mm -hmm. or being struck with inspiration for your next piece or whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's maybe that pain in my left side is actually a sign that I have liver cancer and I'm going to mm -hmm. die young and it sucks. Sometimes it's, what if, what if I swerved off the end of the edge of the road here right mm -hmm. now? And it turns into an intrusive thought because then I think, oh, God, what does that mean about me? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, remember the brain's job? I, didn't, I don't know who said this, but it's a great thing. The brain's job is not to keep you happy. It is to keep you alive. Mm 
-hmm. So if it has spare resources, it's going to think about things which are not currently problems or things which are not uh, are solutions not to current problems, but potentially to future problems. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the solutions can be very fun. Mm -hmm. That's like deep daydreaming and fantasizing mm -hmm. and you come up with stories. And thinking about the potential future problems can be very anxiety inducing, depending on what it is. Yeah. So what an attention sink is, because I think when people are bored, which I think of as a like an emotion, boredom is an emotion to me. It's a yeah. it's a phenomenological state. Mm -hmm. It's a certain way of being and feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think boredom is about I have spare resources and I have not directed them to a particular thing. They're just spare and they're going wherever they go. Mm -hmm. And that can be wonderful because I can come up with some of my most creative stuff when I'm yeah. bored. Yeah. And it can be awful because I can just focus on watching the clock and it feels like it's taking forever for a second to go by yeah. because all of my attention is on the passage of time and nothing else. And so I'm mm -hmm. noticing it to a degree that just sucks. Mm -hmm. So attention sinks to me are these things where any spare attention I have left over can get directed at these things. If you think about like the way that someone who loves baseball thinks about baseball, mm -hmm. that in their spare moments, they're thinking about baseball. Mm -hmm. reading articles about it, watching ESPN, talking to friends about it, that most hobbies like D&D &D and reading and mm -hmm. knitting, and I have a particular use of the word hobby. I don't mean that got me into a miscommunication somewhat recently. Uh, I'm talking about attention sinks, mm -hmm. the kinds of things that when it's there's a moment and 98% of my awareness is taken up, but there's an extra little two. Instead of that extra little two just being a little nagging voice in the back of my head saying, I think you might be sick in some way. Mm -hmm. That it's, yeah. oh, I really, I wonder how I could get past that boss fight and whatever. You know, like, mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So what about the screen in my environment? The screens attention you're thinking sinks. of is attention sinks. I am thinking about it. You are, you're think, you think your conception of them is that they are attention, attention sinks, sinks. That they will yeah. pull all your spare yeah. attention and you don't want that. You mm -hmm. want your spare attention to go somewhere else, mm -hmm. which is part of why I'm saying part of the problem is your conceptualization of it is that you think of them as having an inherent power that they can make you do things that you don't want to do. Like pay attention to them when you don't want to. Having the option to watch something on the TV would mean that you are forced to watch something on the TV. I have so many things I want to say. Can you finish your point though? Uh, and you don't want that. You want, you want the boredom partly because you probably want to be able to direct those to good problems that you've chosen, yeah. but also partly because you do have a belief the same way that you have a conceptualization that screens will call your attention, whether you want them to or not, which I think there's some validity to that. Uh, -huh. uh you also have a conception about boredom as many people do that it is beneficial because good things happen from it. This is one of the big arguments against screens with kids is they have to be bored sometimes. I don't feel bored when I'm not looking at a screen in my apartment. Your spare resources sometimes go, I'm guessing here, mm -hmm. and you say whatever you want to say, but sometimes the leftover resources that are not necessary to navigate the environment or yeah. solve some particular problem mm -hmm. go to very enjoyable things to think about, even things about like, you know, thoughts about your work or yeah. therapy or psychology. But or sometimes whatever. it literally is observing the beauty of my immediate environment and appreciating appreciating it in a way that makes me feel more alive. Great. Sometimes. And sometimes it goes to stuff that makes you very anxious. And then I pick up my phone. <laughs> and look at a screen. <laughs> I know I'm trying to end the stream right now. Well, that's great. Also, <laughs> podcasts. You listen to podcasts a ton. So many. Functionally, podcasts. those podcasts are the exact same to you as using a screen would be, except that it's audio instead of visual. So yeah. there might be a, a sensory sensitivity that's involved. Yeah. But take away the visual versus auditory, like the sensory yeah. element of the medium and the podcast and going online to read articles is the exact same thing. Yeah, I, I, um, I won't name this person's name because they are a controversial figure, but they um, talk about how much they love podcasts because they can still take like a nature walk and be immersed in the visual data of nature and still get 
some sort of intellectual information and the same with audiobooks. And I think however my brain is wired is similar where I can like, it's like a presence that feels much better than a screen. So that again, hints at a visual sensitivity mm -hmm. because I really like to read a book outside mm -hmm. where I'm not getting the visual data of the outdoors mm -hmm. because that's coming from the book yeah. or it's dedicated to the book. I get the peripheral and some, you know, I'm mm -hmm. looking around a little bit, but I get the auditory data mm -hmm. from outdoors, You're which you like are to not getting. To birds. Sometimes in the leaves and I have other theories about this we don't have time for, but but what, is it, ASMR what that person, <laughs> what that person, it reveals a bias toward because somebody else could say, well, I don't want to have a podcast going when I'm out in wilderness. I want to hear the sounds of nature and be yeah, present. Yeah, so I put it in one ear. <laughs> which just divides so your attention. So I can do everything. It just means that you get less <laughs> from both, which yeah. is fine. You get yeah. some from nature and some from the podcast, not as much as you would. Yeah. And that's fine. So is your whole thing, the Brandon thing of we take away the moralistic implications and we yes. get to the specific and then we can just be humans and everything's okay. Yes. And that we, we can live happy lives. That we understand the value that things present to us. If we, <laughs> One of the reasons yeah. I jump on the word screen is because if a person is saying screen or screen time, not once in my life have I ever heard someone use those words and be referring to it in a positive way. Screen. Screen time. Right. If somebody <laughs> likes something, they'll talk about the show they're watching. Yeah. Or yeah. the movie they saw. I really enjoyed or the my game screen time last night. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah. If we're talking about screen time, we're only talking about the negatives and it's overgeneralizing it's things. 1205 or 205, 1405. I'll say one of the reasons that it is such an easy scapegoat that that study wants to say, here's the simple implication. If you just stay off your phone, your relationship will be better mm -hmm. is because it is an unrealistic expectation. Mm -hmm. And so when people fail to do it mm -hmm. and then come to you and say, hey, your advice didn't work for me, mm -hmm. then you can say, yeah, well, because you didn't do it. Not because my conclusion was wrong. If you did it the way I told you to do it. And welcome to toxic therapy. Yes. Instead of dealing with the reality of the situation, they just say, no, I know how to do this. This is simple. I'm an expert. I know mm -hmm. how to do this. You just don't look at your phone. And that's why this is the This Is Not Therapy Hour. And thank you for coming today, everyone. Those people are almost always hypocrites. <laughs> it comes out in the wash eventually. Yeah, Anybody who's like, here's the simple answer, do this. Yeah. Ten years later, you find out, no, no, they were doing that all kinds. And then they're like sitting pretty in their $500,000 home. Yeah. I guess in Northbrook, that would be like a, a normal house. It's not really. I mean, yes, they're going more or less blah, blah, blah. <laughs> really, it's just nothing is that simple. That's all I'm trying mm -hmm. to get at. There are not simple answers. And that's why you are not scalable. Well, and this is a problem, Brandon. <laughs> only if you're trying to scale, which I would like to I am trying to scale. I know. And there, there's a... <laughs> you you make trade-offs and find balances. And yeah, whatever. no, yeah. But I do think it's important that at the core of it, mm -hmm. even if people are going to walk away thinking that your message is, here's the simple, do blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that you put effort into trying to make it clear that that is not. I think the idea that it is simple and that your life would be better if only you just did this simple thing the way that you know you should. Mm -hmm. I think that idea is one of the worst and most harmful concepts in our culture. Mm -hmm. It's at the root of, I think, not root of, but it is a foundational piece of most of the distress, the emotional and social distress. And it also seems exist. like pseudo religious. Yeah, it's hyper individualistic and moralistic. Yeah. It's it's on you. If only you did this thing different. If only you dieted and lost that weight. If only yeah. you stopped engaging with those screens the way you do, you lazy so and so. Yeah, that, you'd be as happy as I am. Exactly. President of but the those United people States. don't actually do that stuff because it's not real. Mm -hmm. You go find me one doctor who says no screen time zero to two. Which if they do, their information's way out of date. That was a recommendation from the uh, American Association of Pediatricians in 1996 and they revoked it in 2015 and replaced mm -hmm. it with other things so anybody who's still saying that is not operating in good faith or at least they're not updated but find me one person who advocates for that and their child literally actually did not look at a single screen from the ages of zero to two it does not happen it's impossible now right yeah if nothing else you're in a restaurant or at a store or whatever mm -hmm. and they're gonna see some screen like and i don't like tvs in restaurants <laughs> well i can see that some people do. Yeah.
Anyway, you're right. We got to get going, and there's a lot to be said about this. I am and, perceiving you believe you are wrapping up a point you're making? No. Okay. Just kind of rephrasing and reframing things that you and I have both been saying for the last five minutes of just mm -hmm. relax, everyone. I'm not right. You're not right. There's no, it's not even about size. It's just, it's complicated and you come up with your theories and you test them and it's not all on you. You're not just sad because you're doing something wrong. There's more to it than that. Yeah. And it doesn't mean ignore it and there's nothing can be done about it or yeah. it doesn't mean you're doomed. You know, it just, life is complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not a simple thing we can just figure out cognitively and then implement a single solution. And, now and even if better. we have a single solution, change happens exactly so you know yeah i do think it would be nice if everyone could kind of just give themselves a bit of a break not to say i shouldn't try to make things better mm -hmm. but to say i do want to continue to try and make things better and i have been trying so the mm -hmm. solution isn't for me to start trying i've been trying yeah i got to do different things yeah. if i want it to be better is that a is that an end point i thought my end points were better but that's now fair. we really need the end point. So that's an end point, Brandon. <laughs> All right. What is an end? What is a beginning? What do you mean by an end point? Yeah, Thank you enough. for coming today. <laughs> this is why it's helpful to have Marie here sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Not that I don't Marie's enjoy super doing fun. it. This way. No, Marie's I super love fun. Marie. Yeah. Uh, and this was fun too. She and keeps us grounded. I would love to talk more about sci fi and fantasy and the hero's journey. It's and fun stuff to learn too. more about it because I have never really been part of that culture, but. A lot of the people in my life are. You'd love it. Yeah, I think I would. And I think it's a really good thing to talk about for neurodivergent people, too, because I have lots of neurodivergent clients who just, like, love, love those things. Well, that's part of the reason I push on the screens thing, too, even though it's a separate or at least overlapping but distinct mm -hmm. thing, is that a lot of the things that especially neurodivergent people tend to enjoy and find restful and recuperative mm -hmm. and whatever get demonized as being bad for you, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason that being neurodivergent gets pathologized. We're 10 minutes over. All right, all right. This was great. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you for the reminder. As soon as you say that, I can remember exactly where it took place between those two rooms in the hall by the stairs. Anyway, See, I thank can't you all. read the comments. It was the Mass Effect thing. Oh, okay. I don't remember which game it's from. Thank you. I'll be Bye. here next week. Caitlin will be back with us in a couple weeks. Goodbye.